All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I imagine some other folks may join us. Um, but what I'm going to do today is talk to you guys a little bit about the research experiences for undergraduates program at the Dauphin Island Sea Lab on coastal Alabama. And I'm going to run you guys through a presentation um, and tell you a little bit about our program. And then the really, I think, most important thing about this presentation is that you guys are going to get the unique benefit of having some tips and tricks on what to do to make the best possible most competitive application. So I am definitely going to give you guys some the inside scoop on how to prepare a really good solid competitive application. And I also want to say hi to Claire. Thank you for joining us. Claire, are you willing to do your little intro that you did before to tell the folks about the program? Yeah, of course. So guys, this is Claire uh, and Claire Legaspi is one of our former REUs. She was actually with us just this past summer. And I just thought it'd be really cool if you could hear from one of the students themselves on some of the things that were um, cool about our program and what their experience was. And you should be able to share your screen if you'd like to or whatever you would like to do. Awesome, let me see. Okay, you guys see my screen? Yes, we can see the poster. Awesome. It's not in presentation mode, it's in, yeah. Here we go. Awesome, thanks. Can you guys like see the little uh, screen, but like the um, Zoom thing that I have here too? Or here, maybe maybe that's a little bit better. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Claire. Uh, I participated in the program this uh, earlier this year in the summer. That's me in the poster actually with the white cap. And uh, can I say that Julian was actually really excited that he got to be at the, on the front. <laughs> I don't know if he told you about that, but he was really excited <laughs> that he was on the front. <laughs> um, so I go to Texas a and University. My major is ecology and conservation biology. And I'm a sophomore now, but when I was applying to the program, I was a freshman. So it's never too early to apply. Uh, and so the way the program works, you are paired with a mentor generally based on your interests. So because I was interested in fishery science, uh, I was paired with uh, Ron Baker, who is a um, fishery scientist. So my project mainly involves uh, pulling stay nets at a bunch of different sites and then identifying what was in those nets and kind of comparing uh, the nesting communities of different sites. And I also did a little bit of diet work and a little bit of calorimetry work. So outside of your own projects, there are a lot of opportunities, like a lot of learning opportunities. Uh, so in these top two pictures, I'm helping a PhD student out with her project. Uh, she did a lot of, she does a lot of work with um, redfish. So here we actually got to put trackers in redfish, which is really cool. If you guys have never seen that done, it's like um, you, you actually like open like the, the little body cavity of the fish. So then you drop a tracker in and then you sew it up. It's actually really neat. And then here she's taking a bunch of like tissue samples, odorless uh, islands and stuff like that. And then we also got to do a few uh, necropsies. We got to do an alligator necropsy and then a, a bottle of dolphin necropsy as well, which is very neat. Uh, and I actually learned a lot from my peers. So as you can see, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, different options for, for potential projects. Everybody studies something different. And so you get to learn about um, everything a little bit just by talking to your peers and stuff like that. Uh, so most of the skills I gained were fisheries related, obviously, because I was working in a fisheries lab. Uh, I also got to write up all the uh, data I um, collected and it's been submitted for publication. So that's very exciting. Uh, and there's a lot of benefits just to the internship in general. For example, you can live by the beach, which is pretty awesome. And uh, an REU does look really good on your resume because REUs are pretty competitive. And that's all I have. Uh, but if you guys have any like fisheries questions or questions about the program in general, or if you're uh, even interested in coming to Texas a and I can help you with that. Thank you so much, Claire. I appreciate your time. Uh, I figure you're probably not gonna stay with us. So um, hopefully I will see you again soon, but I really appreciate you sharing your experience. All right. Uh, so Thank for, you for having me. Absolutely. And I love that you shared your email in case other folks um, 
have questions. So thank you so much for that. All right, so for everybody else, this is our group from this past year. And I'm just, like I said, gonna go through and give you a, yeah, you're right in the middle, Claire. <laughs> give you guys uh, just a summary of our program, what we're about, and just to also give you an introduction to uh, RU programs in general. These are research experiences for undergraduates programs that are funded by the National Science Foundation. And NSF has put a lot of money in recent years into these programs for very specific reasons. In their own research, they found that these kinds of field specific experiences were the single most factor, you know, one important factor, once, you know, sort of like gen general requirements were met, these experiences were the single most important factor in determining whether students were selected for graduate school or selected for jobs in STEM fields. And so these can be really, really important and they're even more important than other types of job experiences. Um, but the problem has historically been, you know, in the past and certainly when I was coming up in science, um, these programs weren't paid. You either had to pay for them or at the very least you had to volunteer your time. And so NSF has put a lot of money into these programs so that students can come to these programs at no cost to themselves. There's no cost to apply. And the idea is for you to have to pay nothing. So your travel gets covered, your food and your housing is covered. And on top of that, you get a paycheck. And so I'll go through all those details as I go through the program and explain you know, sort of uh, what the goals are of our program and how you can apply. So just to give you an introduction to the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, for those of you who are from Alabama, you may already be aware that the Dauphin Island Sea Lab were housed here on the Alabama coast. You can see us in red, our coastline's about this big. And the Dauphin Island Sea Lab is right here on a, one of the islands that separates the Gulf of Mexico um, from Mississippi Sound. And so we have a really great location. We are the physical sort of home of what's Alabama's Marine Environmental Sciences Consortium, which is the research and educational marine science consortial outlet for the 22 public and private universities in the state of Alabama. So if you are a student, this is your first tip. If you are a student who is at a school in Alabama, who's one of our MESC partners, you automatically count as a student who is underserved and underrepresented. And we have liaison officers who are specifically, uh, their job is to help you. And if you tell your liaison officer, I'll show you some contacts at the end, um, if you tell them that you've applied, have them contact me and let me know, hey, I have this student who's applied. We'll flag your application and make sure that it gets observed. And this becomes really important because we get about 300 inquiries to our program and about 200 applications. And so it's really important to have those kinds of connections. So if you are an MESC student, um, definitely make sure you take advantage of that. I will also add that if you are a student who's anywhere on the Gulf Coast here in the South, you are also typically in an area that's considered underserved and underrepresented in STEM fields. And so again, automatically, that gives your application a little bit of a boost. So it's definitely something that you wanna take advantage of. And the lights just turned off on me, <laughs> the ambiance. Um, so this shows you where our campus is located and why we are so uh, well-suited for doing marine science. Um, but this is the next important point I wanna make for you guys. We don't we aren't necessarily looking for students who are majoring in marine science. We're not looking for students who know that they want to do marine science. Um, we just happen to be scientists who study marine models, but we are interested in taking students who are, who are interested in any field, any science, technology, engineering, mathematics field. If you have a genuine interest and you're not sure what you wanna do, that's the perfect kind of student for our program because our goal is to teach you good science, and to help you figure out if this is what you're interested in or if it's a different field of science. But we get a lot of students who are interested in pre-vet, pre-med. It's just a great way for you to get your foot in the door with any kind of science, science skills and figure out what you're interested in. So please don't feel like you have to already know that you wanna be a marine scientist or even that you want my job. I mean, it's great if you do come and get it, but you know, you know, if you're uncertain, if you think you want to go and work for a state agency, or maybe you want to do something completely different, you know, this is your chance to explore. And that's what our program is really for, to find students who are interested in science of some kind and give you a chance to explore those interests. Um, so the Dauphin Island Sea Lab, the way we're set up, we have three different sort of major programs or departments. The first one is the university programs, and that's the department that I'm part of. And that's where we have our undergraduate and graduate education, and we do our primary research. And that's also the department in which the RU program is housed. So your faculty that you would be partnered with for your research and for the program will all be part of this university programs. 
But in addition to that, we also have Discovery Hall programs, which is a K through 12 program, where they have a whole separate set of faculty that are specifically interested in translating science to a younger audience and to teachers and education. Um, and the cool thing is that also means you have access to those resources and interacting with those people. So as part of our program, you know, there's also a chance, depending on your project, that you would have a chance to interact with these folks and talk about you know, education. If maybe you're interested in K-12 education and bringing science to those students, you get a chance to, to learn about that as well. And then of course, we have a public aquarium. Uh, for those of you who are in Alabama and grew up in this area, you may have actually come to Dauphin Island Sea Lab for a field trip. Um, our aquarium is new. We have lots of new cool things. Um, so if you haven't been, uh, or if you've been and you haven't been for a long time, it'd just be a really cool opportunity. Anyone who comes down here as part of our program, um, one of our field trips, typically we do a behind the scenes with the aquarium. And we've even had students who have partnered because we have sometimes have students who are interested in being aquarists. So we've had students who partnered with aquarium staff to do their research projects, and that can work out really well. So that's also a possibility. Um, we have a really nice fleet of boats. So again, depending on your project, you might be going out on one of the big educational offshore cruise boats, or you might be working, say, up in the upper reaches of the Delta in one of our smaller vessels. This is actually one of our REU students from the past with uh, one of the students that she was working with. Um, and then as Claire mentioned in her intro, uh, regardless of what your project is, even if your project is mostly working on land, not on boats, or you're working on small boats, not the large ones, we provide lots of opportunities and we encourage, you know, as long as your work is in hand to get together with other students, go out with them. So you get a chance to experience all these things. And we also do provide field trips and cruises. One of our faculty members offers a sampling cruise to all the REUs a couple of times during the summer. And so even if that's not your specific research project, in addition to your specific research project, you can have the opportunity to participate in all of these other, you know, get a chance to get out on these different boats and, and do these different things. Um, Claire talked about this a little bit, you know, the cross training, um, but for example, we had a student who her work was mostly with um, manatees working with uh, samples that had already been collected, but one of our professors was going out to do shark tagging and sampling. And so she and a couple of the other REUs got a chance to go out and spend a day out on the boat tagging sharks, you know, even though that wasn't her core project, because we really want you to see and do as many different things as you can to get as many different experiences. Now, as of 2015, we also have now a Marine Mammal Research Center on our campus. And the cool thing about this building is it's essentially like a surgical suite. So if you're interested in pre-vet or pre-med, you can have a chance to potentially work with some of our staff as part of the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network, or we typically have a veterinarian on staff who can be a partner with students. Um, and even if you're not interested in that, you're doing something completely different, like Claire was doing her fisheries work, uh, she came and, and participated in necropsies. And we don't just do marine mammals here. We've had oarfish. We had, uh, Claire showed a picture of the alligator we had in here, um, any kind of big animal. And we have one of the uh, nicest, essentially surgical suites on the Gulf Coast, um, where we're mostly dealing with animals that have already died and we're determining cause of death. But regardless of if you're interested in just looking and you know, being a looky-loo and saying, oh man, that's cool or that's gross and that's not your thing and you just wanna see it and move on, or if you're really in it and you want to participate, you want to take samples, you want to take data, there are opportunities for students to get involved in all levels of that. And we open that to all of the REU students. Um, so to tell you a little bit about our program specifically. Um, you know, so we are one of many, many, many REU programs that exist in the country. And so here's another tip for you guys. This is your next special tip for, for attending the webinar. I really want you to apply to our program. But if you're going to apply to our program, all the applications are actually fairly similar. It's worth it to you to poke around online on the NSF website and find the list of programs and apply to more than one. In fact, I would encourage you to apply to as many of these programs as you can. And some of them even have one application for multiple programs and you can take advantage of that. Um, but the more programs you apply to, the more likely you are to get selected. And just as Claire said, they're all really competitive. So definitely apply to more than one, but definitely make sure you apply to ours because we want you. <laughs> and the DACA and C-Lab has had our program since the mid nineties. We've been running a program basically off and on. Our program has evolved over time. We've always been very interested in bringing research opportunities to students who wouldn't otherwise have them. That's a big thing for our program. Um, and so 
early on in our program that we had a heavy focus on trying to recruit women and we were very successful at that and at, at bringing science to women, getting women involved in and retained in STEM. Um, and now our program has opened up to being more about um, bringing research to students who don't otherwise have it. So here's some more tips for you guys. If you are at an institution that doesn't do a lot of research where you don't have a lot of opportunities, you know, particularly if you're early in your career and they give the opportunities to the juniors and seniors, or if you are at an institution that doesn't have graduate programs and doesn't do a lot of research, if you don't have, like maybe you have research, but don't have research in marine sciences, that this is gonna be a novel opportunity for you. Those are the kind of things you wanna bring out in your application, okay? And this is my next really big tip for you guys. These programs are kind of different than a lot of other programs that you may have seen and apply to where, you know, usually you wanna kind of brag about all the experiences you've had and how great you are and all these things you've done. But our program, remember, is designed to bring you experiences you haven't had. So what you want to do with our application is make sure you are emphasizing where you have not had experiences and you're emphasizing what this program can give you that you don't already have, right? So showing where you've had challenges or hurdles in your career where you wanted to do something and you weren't able to do it, that you, you have a dedicated interest in science, but you've had some hurdles to, to having those experiences. That's the stuff that you wanna bring out in your application and demonstrate how this program is going to help you. Those are the best students, the ones who demonstrate how our program is gonna be meaningful for them and help them and that they're really interested and they just wanna you know, learn something about science and how to do better science and what our program can provide, okay? Um, and this also means that we are particularly looking for students who are otherwise underrepresented in STEM. So that means if, and this is broadly interpreted, it could be low income, it could be students who are members of the LGBTQ community, it could be students who are um, otherwise, you know, ethnic minorities that are underserved and underrepresented, students who come from parts of the country, like here in the South, where you don't have a lot of these kinds of opportunities, or any way in which you have limited research opportunities. If you have had, if you're non-traditional, if you're an older student, you have children, if you've had to take care of, you know, ailing parents, all of these things can get in the way of your education. And so this is where, you know, whatever you're comfortable with di disclosing about yourself and your experiences, those are the kinds of things that will help us best figure out if we are meeting the needs of the students who will most benefit from this program. So think about those kinds of things when you are writing your application and also when you are re requesting your letters of support from faculty, make sure they are aware of those kinds of challenges and hurdles because they can also point those things out in your letters, okay? Um, so just to tell you a little bit about our program then for this year, we usually take nine, eight or nine interns. We expect to take eight this summer. It's a 10 week program. This is a fully immersive in-person program, which is kind of unique in that way. And we've been able to maintain an in-person program even all the way through COVID and didn't have a single case of COVID in our program. We're very excited. Um, but it's a 10-week program that's going to run from May 29th to August 4th. And we will put you together with a faculty mentor who will do a primary research project with you. And this just gives you an example of some of our students who we've had in recent years. Um, Tara Turner was at Judson College, which is here in Alabama. She was one of my REUs. We've also had a student like Harrison Watson, who is from Mississippi at Jackson State. And this is Chasia Johnson. She's from Talladega, which is also here in Alabama. And she's the student that I was mentioning who did some work with manatees, but then got really super excited because she got a chance to go out and catch sharks. And that's Chasia with her shark friend out on the boat. Uh, this is um, the faculty, just some of the faculty who you have a chance to select as mentors in our program. And this is where I'm going to give you guys your next super important tip. So if you're taking notes, make sure to write this down. When you go into our application portal, and I'll give you the link to do this a little bit later, um, you'll have a chance to look at our faculty. There's just a little short blurb about each faculty member and the types of research that they do. Read through those. There's a link that can take you, if you're interested in more information, it can take you to the faculty members' individual web pages. You can explore and see what you like. Kind of get an idea of the kinds of projects and the kinds of science that you think are most exciting to you. Then when you go into the application, there are places where it allows you to, there's a, a like a drop-down menu where you can pick who are the faculty that you're interested in working with. Okay, this is really important. 
do not select just one faculty member. Even if you think you only wanna work with one faculty member, um, because if you do that, guess how many faculty members will be guaranteed to look at your application? Just one, right? I recommend selecting at least three to five faculty members that are genuinely people that you are interested in potentially working with. And we often find, you know, sometimes students have interests in one area and sometimes they select faculty members they don't realize aren't actually a great fit, right? So if you will pick three to five people, don't pick everybody because it makes you look fruity, but if you pick three to five people, that guarantees that at least those three to five people will look at your application. And we have the ability in our system to flag students. So if, if you say, for example, selected me, and you're interested in working with me, but I realize that you'd be a better fit for a different faculty member, I can actually flag that and make sure that that other faculty member sees your application and gets a chance to look at you. So definitely make sure you pick three to five in the drop down menu. Then in the application, there are three short answer, like little short essay questions. They're not super long, it's super easy, um, but in there you get a chance to write about your interests. Make sure that you are showing, you know, this is my other big tip, everybody writes, Oh, I love the ocean. I've always loved the ocean. I've been going to the ocean since I was a kid. This is why I want to do marine science. That doesn't help you stand out and make you exciting, right? Write about the things in that research that were of interest to you. What are you really interested in exploring and in science and testing and, and figuring out, right? You don't have to, to propose a project, but just show that you have some grounded real interest. And in, by reading the faculty's descriptions, you can kind of get a sense of what those things are that are exciting to you. And then in your little narrative, you can actually name those faculty that you also picked in your drop down menu and add this statement. This is really important. State, state in there, but I am open to working with any faculty member. That way, you've picked three to five people who are guaranteed to look at your application and either take you or flag you for someone else. And in your written statement, you have said, but. I'm willing to work with anyone. So that means that if I see your statement, I think you're a better fit to somebody else, I can flag you and that person can see that you are open to working with anyone, okay? So that's super important, okay? That will help you guys out a lot, get you maximum coverage. All right, so among all of those faculty, there's a lot of different areas that we cover and we have a little bit of everything for everyone. And like I said, we don't, you, know, you don't have to know that you're necessarily interested in marine science. Um, but we can give you experiences broadly using marine models in a lot of different topics. So we have folks who do biological, physical, chemical oceanography. We do fit, uh, the fisheries type work that Claire talked about, aquaculture. We have folks who do more general ecology, do some modeling of ecosystem functions. So if you're more interested in the, the physical and chemical environment, there are folks who do that. We have a toxicologist. We actually have a couple of toxicologists who do really cool work um, understanding like harmful algal bloom, effects and then have links to public health. And so that can be a really good hook for folks who are interested in marine uh, medicine or aquatic animal medicine or human health and human medicine. We have folks who do all kinds of like biogeochemistry and modeling and genetics and microbial ecology. Um, we've had a lot of students who've come through and worked with our geneticists or our microbial ecologists who've gone on to do things like graduate programs in immunology or medical school. Uh, we also have, uh, because we have that Marine Mammal Research Center, we do a lot with marine mammal ecology, marine mammal medicine, and any kind of aquatic animal medicine, also in conjunction with the Marine Mammal Research Center and the aquarium. So a little bit of something for everyone. And so what I want to do now is just go through a few of these examples, kind of like Claire gave you her in-person um, example, and just show you what has happened with some of our recent students. So this is um, Dr. Lee Smee. He's also our chair of the university programs here at the C-Lab. He does sensory biology and one of his recent REU students, um, MRL Eason, was with us in 2021. She's on the University of Northern Arizona. She actually, um, after she finished her REU, she stayed on to become a master's student in one of our uh, master's programs. And her faculty mentor ended up sending her to a conference. She went to the Benthic Ecology Society meeting and won the best undergraduate student poster award based on her REU project. So she's kind of a great case study of what is capable for some of our students. Um, and we do have a number of students who come through our program who ultimately opt to come back and go to graduate school, either for master's degrees, professional master's degrees, or PhDs in our program. 
And we do try to send every one of our students, give them the opportunity to go to a scientific conference because after you've been through our program and you have this wonderful product, you're gonna make a poster, you get this experience, you can take it on and share it at scientific conferences. And we will pay for students to do that. We sponsor students to do that. Um, another example of this is Ronnie Baker. He was Claire's uh, mentor. Two of his students, Trinity Curry and Jordan King, I wanna talk about just a little bit. Um, Trinity actually ultimately ended up um, publishing her work within six months of her RU. She and Ronnie turned it into a paper and got it published. And so she already, and this is huge for undergraduates, you know, to actually already, to be an undergraduate student already have a, a scientific publication under your belt is, it's huge. It gives you a, a real leg up when you're applying to graduate school or you're applying for jobs. Um, and then Jordan, um, similarly, he's putting his work together with work by one of Ronnie's graduate students, and they're working on a paper. But he also, in the meantime, has been accepted to a graduate program at a university in Florida doing fisheries work. So he's already been accepted into a master's program. Hello, my name is Trinity Curry. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I go to Stillman College in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and I'm a biology major. I'm working with Dr. Baker and Dr. Kraus on the variability of microphytobenthos. So right here, you will see me gathering samples for dissolving organic carbon from the water. So right here, I'm getting the open water samples. I'm using a syringe to carefully draw the water up and put it into a vial. And I'm going to fill the vial to capacity so there's no air, bowls, air bubbles or any space in between for anything to happen. <laughs> I think it's always better when you guys get a chance to hear um, about students' experiences from the students themselves. Uh, and so one of the things that we have our students do, and that if you come to our program, um, what that you would get a chance to do is actually create sort of a day in the life video or a video blog or a vlog. Uh, and all the students do these and it gives a chance, we share this on all of our social media networks on Instagram and on Facebook. And that way your, your teachers at your home institution or your friends, your colleagues, your parents, your family can actually keep up with you in real time on social media and see what you're doing. But it also gives folks like you who have interest in the program a chance to see what our students are actually doing and see them you know, doing it out in the field. And one of the things I love about Trinity's video, she added that clapping at the end herself, which I think is absolutely hilarious. Um, but she talked about things like dissolved inorganic carbon. And it's a great opportunity for me to point out that, you know, Trinity didn't know what dissolved inorganic carbon was when she started our program. And this is another, you know, important tip for you guys. We have no expectation when you come into our program that you're going to know these things, right? We, we expect to take you from a place of dependence independent, to, to a place of independence during your time with us. So we will teach you that kind of thing. We'll teach you that terminology. We'll teach you everything that you need to, to know to go out in the field and collect samples or to create your products or to analyze your data. That's our job. So, you know, don't feel intimidated by that. You know, none of our students knew these things when they came in. These are things that they learned as part of our program. Um, another great example, um, this is Dr. Kelly Dorgan and her student, Sarah Cole. Sarah was part of our RU program in 2015. And I like to mention Sarah because she's an example of one of the students who came in. She actually ended up doing, coming back after she finished her RU, she graduated, came back to work with Dr. Dorgan as a master's student, graduated and is now a professional scientist with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. You know, and there's no reason why that can't be any one of you guys doing something like this. And her project was kind of cool. Um, she was interested in these polychaete worms, which are shown here in this picture, that burrow into oysters. And you can imagine if you're trying to sell really nice oysters at fancy restaurants for a nice high price, most people don't like to slurp down their raw oysters and see a big hairy polychaete coming out, staring them in the eye. Personally, I would like that because I think that's cool. I love polychaetes and I love oysters, but most people who are buying their oysters at a fancy restaurant don't want that. And so her project was very application-based, trying to figure out if there's ways to keep the polychaetes from burrowing into the oysters in the first place, or if we can't do that, how do we get them out before they go to market? So you can imagine how important this would be to our coastal economy and to our local watermen who are trying to make a living from harvesting oysters. And also to those of us who like to eat oysters at restaurants. <laughs> um, here's another couple of examples uh, in recent years, Alexis Davis from Alabama State and Lauren Alvaro. Um, Lauren also, I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit about her project. Um, so my name is Lauren Alvaro. I'm a rising senior at Florida Gulf Coast University. 
this summer at Dolphin Island Sea Lab. We're working with Dr. John later to measure the stocks and sources of organic matter in Mobile Bay through stable isotope analysis with nitrogen 15 and carbon 13. Um, this week, we went out in Mobile Bay to collect sediment and water samples. So we collected surface waters and bottom water using Niskin. And to collect the sediment, we were using a conar grab. And I also really like Lauren's video because she shows you everything that students get a chance to do. I mean, who doesn't want to be out on Mobile Bay on the water at night and the rigs and the lights? It's gorgeous. Um, but also getting a chance to get muddy and wet and dirty, but then coming back to the lab and doing this very, you know, precise, clean work. And again, just like with Trinity, you know, she didn't know about stable isotopes. I mean, she's using terms here that if you're not familiar with them, that is entirely okay. Um, all that, these things, all these terms, all of these techniques are skills that they picked up here as part of the program. And so you'll get a chance to work with your mentor closely, become part of their lab, and actually learn all of these things and do all of this work together with them. Um, um, another example I want to give is, uh, and I've got four on here because this is just a really exciting story. These are our two toxicologists, Dr. Molly Miller and Allison Robertson. And just this past summer, these are four RU students that worked with these two toxicologists for the last four years. Um, Dr. Robertson actually fully funded all four of her REUs to come back to the U.S. Harmful Algal Bloom meeting that was just held this past summer. And so all four of them got a chance to present their posters and the work that they had been continuing to do after their REU. And one of them was even selected for a talk. This young man here, Charlie, um, was selected for a talk. And the cool thing about this is all these different four REUs, none of them knew each other but they all get a chance to come together and see what each other has done and how their work integrates together and get to have this really great uh, networking experience where they could see and meet leaders in their field. And again, all of this was fully funded by our research programs at no cost to the students so they could go uh, you know, and actually have this experience at a scientific meeting. Uh, and I think this is my last example I'm gonna give. This is, you know, I've talked a lot about the possibility of linking medicine and some of this aquatic animal uh, work. And this is a great example. Our microbial ecologist, Dr. Brandy Kill Reese, has worked uh, several times with our veterinarian for the Alabama Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And these are two of their recent REU students who are both from here in Alabama, um, Kaylin Nesbitt and Yasmin Hall. Kaylin did her work last year with these two uh, mentors. And her work was really interesting um, with some direct human health implications we had found that there were two dolphins in Mobile Bay that had died of acute sepsis. And we were very interested in whether that infection, because people can die from that infection also, we were very interested in whether or not that was related to water quality in Mobile Bay. And so Kaylin worked with these two folks and was able to actually sequence the bacteria that was coming from, that, that caused the septic, sepsis and figure out where it was coming from. And basically what she found out is that it was most likely derived from feral hogs that are living on the watersheds. So we have these wild boar. And then when it would rain, their feces would wash into the bay and that created a bacterial problem that poses a direct mortality risk for our marine mammals, but also potentially for people. And so you, know, you can imagine how really incredibly important this work is. And she has already uh, gotten her work published as a, a genetic note, and they're working on a larger full publication of her work. And you know, so this is within a year, she was able to actually get a publication out. Um, and similarly, like Yasmin Hall was doing work with these two folks, but looking at the different types of communities of bacteria that live on dolphin skin, because that can be related to health. And there's also, again, applications to other types of species and people as well. And they're currently working on a publication for Yasmin's work as well. And Yasmin also just came back and this fall uh, went to the Gulf Estuarine Research Society meeting with my research team. All right, so what are some of the tangible benefits that you guys are going to get if you come to our program? Obviously, you're going to be getting a chance to do the kind of team and independent research that I just described for all of these students. Um, that could be a combination of field and lab sampling. We try to make sure you guys get a lot of cross training. There is that chance to participate in necropsy. So necropsies are essentially like animal autopsies in our surgical suite and understand causes of death, whether you're observing or participating. And then a lot of chance to learn 
different types of, of high-end techniques. And that could be molecular or genomic or water quality. And we also take you to that next step of learning how to process, analyze, and even store your data. Um, and then we do uh, some additional workshops on communication as well. So we will teach you, for example, how to create a poster, like the one that's shown in this bottom image here, uh, and how to give a short presentation of that poster. And so again, these are things that we don't expect you to know how to do, but we expect to train you and provide you with these learning opportunities through our program. So emphasize no experience needed. Uh, and then what are the brass tacks? Uh, I kind of mentioned this up front. We expect this program to be no cost to you. So there's no cost for you to fill out the application. You don't have to pay for any formal transcripts. You don't have to pay to have anything sent from your university. It's all free. Uh, we have a $6,000 stipend that we pay you. And our expectation is that you can leave the summer with that full $6,000 in your pocket because we will cover travel to and from the program. And we also provide full room and board while you're here. We have cottages on site. We typically have three students per cottage. So each student gets their own room, but you have a shared kitchen and central living space. And that also gives you a chance to get to know your colleagues and develop collaborations that way as well. And then for food, we actually, because we know everyone has different requirements, different allergies, different preferences. Um, so we have a cafe on our campus. You can choose to eat there if you like to, but you don't have to. And we also have a number of restaurants nearby. Um, but what we do is we give you an additional $125 per week to use for food, however you want to use it. And so if you are somebody who you want to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day, and you can eat for a lot less than $125 a week, that's great. You still get the money. You can put it in your pocket, whatever you don't spend. Um, and we also do help students with grocery runs or ordering groceries. Um, and make sure that everyone has transportation to get what you need so that you can make your own meals. You know, and if you're going in the field, you may need to make lunches and that kind of thing. But that way, it's entirely up to you how you want to use that money and what you'd like to eat. Um, so in terms of specific workshops that we offer, you know, like I said, we are all about, you know, taking you from a place of dependence to independence. So we're going to give you workshops on experimental design and data analysis and data management. We're going to specifically talk to you about how do you write a paper? If you want to turn, you know, we give this opportunity to students to turn their projects into papers by the end of the summer. And so how do you do that? How do you give a presentation and make that poster? And then like Claire alluded to, you know, all of these experiences and these workshops and everything go on your CV. And we'll even talk to you about how do you prepare that? CV is essentially a resume. So how do you prepare a really good, solid, competitive CV? And, and so when you leave, you literally have this built and you have a lot of extra things to add on to it. And we'll review that with you and, and talk to you about how to do it. And then we have a number of sort of these more informal, you know, casual lunchtime workshops where we just sit down with students and ask you, what are you interested in? You know, and we get a lot of students who are interested in work-life balance, applying to graduate school, getting other kinds of jobs outside of, of you know, marine science or outside of academia. Um, we get students who wanna talk about mental health and self-care and wellness or, um, women in science or LGBTQ community in science. And so we'll just, you know, kind of sit down and talk about anything that's of interest to you guys that's relevant to your career development. And we look for that kind of feedback on what you're interested in. Um, we also do a number of field trips. Like I said, we get, do a lot of boat trips. So you can see a lot of different habitats and a lot of different types of experiences. We usually try to do at least um, a shellfish hatchery, the aquarium, different animal care facilities. And we try to do a uh, at least two different, either uh, like consulting firms or state or federal or non-government agency tours as well. And the cool thing is now that we're sort of post COVID, we're back to being able to do these in person. You know, for a while we were doing them all virtual, but it's kind of exciting that we can now make these trips again in person. Um, and then the outcome. So our big culminating event is that each student will prepare a poster in collaboration with your lab. And then you'll give your, your poster presentation. And again, we'll work with you on how to do this. You will never be alone any step of the way. You will get to leave with your poster printed. You get to take it with you. You will have your newly developed and enhanced CV or resume. We also, like I mentioned, um, strive to send every one of our students to a scientific meeting even after our program is over. And the cool thing about this is at least one student will be fully funded by NSF 
to go to the annual ocean sciences meeting. They have a special program that's called the, uh, it's the ASL Multicultural Program, and we get to nominate a student and they are guaranteed to be fully funded by NSF to participate in that meeting. And that meeting can be anywhere in the world. This year, our students going to Spain. In the past, we've had students going to Hawaii, to Puerto Rico. Um, sometimes they're in the United States, but they're different places in the country. And so this is a really cool opportunity for you with your mentor to, to be fully funded to go to one of these scientific meetings and really see what it's like to interact with other scientists. In addition to that, we usually send at least one or two other students to that same meeting. And then we also invite the faculty mentors to work with their students to pick other local regional meetings throughout the year that you might be able to come to or um, travel to. And we will work with you on covering those costs as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, we, we now have a relationship with the Gulf and Caribbean Research Journal, which publishes a special REU theme section. And so if you and your mentor want to do it, it's not mandatory, but we offer the opportunity for you to take your poster and turn it into a short communication and it will be published by the end of the year or the next spring. And so within six months of finishing your REU, you can have your work already published, which is a really great thing for your CV and for your next steps in your career. Uh, in addition, we also have se several students who take their projects and go back to their home institution and use them for honors credit. Uh, it depends on what your home institution will allow you to do, but we support that. And our mentors are willing to continue to work with you to turn these into honors projects. And we are also now able to offer college credit. Again, it depends on whether or not your home institution will take the credit. Often it's taken as elective credits. Um, but the cool thing about that is it could actually save you money where you're coming here, you're doing an internship, you're getting paid, but you're actually also able to get two, three, four credits of elective credits to help you graduate earlier. So it actually can save you extra money. Um, again, you have to reach out to your home institution, find out what they'll allow, but then we will help you with that paperwork to make sure you get that credit. Uh, and then I just wanna show you just some examples. And this is a cross section historically. So you can see a wide range of what our students have had a chance to do. And we've had you know, about 200 students who've come through our program. So this is just a really small sampling, but we've had students who've gone on to professional scientist positions like with the US Geological Survey who are now faculty members at universities. Um, this one, Katie Interlikia, she's one of my favorite examples. She was one of my first RU students, and I want her job. She is a content and exhibit content developer for the Museum of Science in Boston. I mean, how cool is that, right? Um, we have a number of students who've gone on to medical school, consulting firms. I mentioned Sarah Cole, who is now with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation uh, Commission. And then Ginny Ree, she's another great example I like to use. She came in and worked with our physical oceanographer. She had never done any data analysis before. Her entire project was learning MATLAB and doing data analysis. After the RU, she opted to change her career path. She decided to become a data analyst. She worked for a consulting firm for many years. And then just this past year, she decided to go back to school, get her master's degree in data analytics. And she credits the RU program at DISL for changing her life in that way. Um, and again, there's no reason why that can't be you guys. Um, I've also talked about pre-vet students. This, this fellow, Terrence Mitchell, was one of the students who worked with our toxicologist. He knew he came in knowing he wanted to be a vet student. He was actually at Tuskegee when he did his REU. Because of the REU program and what he learned here, he was actually able to apply early for the pre-vet program at Tuskegee. And so now he's been pulled into their vet program. So he just rolled from his undergrad right into their vet program. And so now he's a vet student at Tuskegee. Um, and then similarly, Tara Turner, I mentioned her earlier, she was one of my RU students. Um, she came in and did work in my lab um, with shellfish, and she actually then got accepted into the University of Iowa in their immunology department. She's now working on a PhD. So again, this is just, you know, just a small sampling of what RU students have gone on to do um, very often when they didn't even expect to necessarily stay in marine sciences or science in general. Um, and there's no reason why it can't be you guys. So what do you need to do uh, to apply? Go to our website and you'll see when you go to our website, a little logo that says apply today or apply here. And so you can click on that and that will give you everything that you need to know to apply. 
We typically get about 300 inquiries and anywhere from 150 to 200 applications to our program. So you can see why knowing some of these tips and tricks that I've mentioned to you throughout this webinar can be really, really important to a good application. Um, the key things to remember to highlight, and this is, I'm gonna give you guys another tip here. When you go into our application portal, you will get a chance to go in, you'll enter some basic information about yourself, and then you can view the application. I strongly encourage you to print that out or copy all the questions out so that you can then prepare your application offline and have someone else proofread it for you. So have one of your mentors, your liaison officer, even just a friend or colleague who also maybe does science or has a science interest, just proofread, make sure that you didn't make any you know, type errors, that your sentences are complete, that everything kind of flows nicely. And that way you can prepare those three little statements um, separately in advance. And then when you go back into the portal, you can just cut and paste them into the portal, okay? So make sure you're highlighting your genuine interest in science. It doesn't have to specifically be marine science and what you're interested in. And then make sure you're willing to disclose what it is that's most important that's going to help you with this program. What is this program going to give you that you otherwise wouldn't get? Or what hurdles have you had in finding research and being able to achieve research programs in your career so far? And then you'll have those three short statements. We also ask for two letters of recommendation. This is my next tip for you guys. Um, when you choose the folks that you're going to ask for the two letters of recommendation, you'll put their emails into the portal and the portal will send an email to them asking them to submit a letter. Be sure to ask them first before you put them into the portal because you want to make sure that they know what you're doing, right? Also, when you do that, try to give them at least two weeks notice for writing the letter because that means they'll have more time and they'll be able to write you a better letter and share with them you know, if you can share with them your little write-ups and share with them the link to the, our webpage so that they can see what the program's about and they know why you want to join the program and they can see what's important. And then they can also bring that, that content out in your letter and they'll do that. That's what we do. You know, any of that information that you provide us, it'll help us write you a stronger letter. So make sure to give them two weeks notice, ask them in advance and give them a link to our website. And if possible, your three written statements so they can understand why you want to do our program. Um, we also ask for unofficial transcripts and GPA, but I want you to understand that we do not use this information in any way in our selection process. We do not care about your GPA. We often understand that sometimes students who have low GPAs, it's simply because of the very hurdles that prevented them from having these opportunities in the past anyway. And so we're not we're not worried about that. So don't sweat the GPA. Um, the only reason why we ask for this stuff is because it makes sure that you're actually a student. That's the main reason why we ask for it. So, but don't, don't worry about that. So if you just have to turn it in, prove you're a student, but we don't use it in acceptance. And then to give you an idea of what our students typically have looked like, this is just an example from last year. We strive for equality and, and gender neutrality, um, but I will tell you, this is another tip, uh, 85 to 90% of our applicants are women. We have his, done such a great job in biological sciences with bringing and encouraging um, women in science, bringing them together, that we've actually lost men. So if you are a man and you are applying to our program, you actually have a very high likelihood of getting accepted simply because we usually have almost no male applicants. And there have been years when we have had 100% female participation in our program simply because we don't have male applicants. And so all I can say women is that the cream rises to the crop and we will pick the best of the best. And if it's women, it's women. But um, men, you know, if, if there are any of you out there on the webinar, just know that um, we need good, interested men who are not staying in biological sciences for whatever reason. Um, and so that is something to keep in mind. Um, then most of our students come from universities that are low research or otherwise have low research opportunities. And we're now getting almost 50% of our students who are first generation or who come from historically black colleges and universities or minority serving universities or community colleges. So if you are a student who started out at a community college and transferred or you're currently at a community college, um, that does not hurt you in any way. So know that the NSF really um, is looking to, to boost community college participation. And similarly, like Claire said, if you are a freshman or a sophomore, um, there's no reason why you can't start early. We get very few applications from early career students. Um, most of our applications come from the students who are going to be seniors. So, you know, don't let that, um, 
to help you shy away because we definitely are looking for students at all career levels for this program. So here's our application link. Uh, you can also Google us. You can go right to this link. You can take a screenshot of this page. I encourage you to go here because it shows you. You can also poke around and see what some of our former participants look like. You can get a description of our program and see our goals for our program. And then you can also see the application, get in there, put your initial information in to start the portal and then get the application. Um, I also encourage you, I know young people don't use Facebook as much as us old folks do nowadays, um, but I encourage you to go to our Facebook page and you can poke around on there and you can actually see some of the video blogs. You can see what our students have done in the past, the poster symposium, and just see in real time, you know, what our students have done in the past. And then I mentioned early at, up front that if you are a student who's from one of our MESC schools that you have a liaison officer. Um, this is a list of all of our schools and liaison officers. Uh, some of these, they change periodically. So make sure you can reach out. You can reach out to me or you can reach out to your school and find out who your liaison officer is, but definitely contact them. Tell them you're applying. Have them be one of your letter writers. Have them send an email to me and tell me that you've applied. And you yourself can tell me, you know, email me and say, hey, Carmichael, I'm applying to this program. And that way I know to look out for you as an MESC student to make sure that we flag your application. So here's my email. If anyone wants to reach out to me and ask me questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. And I'm going to stay on here after to answer questions. Um, also, we have an, a teaching assistant for the program, and so when you are here in the summer, um, it's absolutely fantastic because you have a near peer who can answer questions and help you out right here on campus, um, and if there's something that comes up where you're not comfortable talking to someone like me, um, you know, there's somebody here, you know, who's, you know, also a student who you can talk to and interact with, and, and she's just a great resource, and she helps out with all the field trips and stuff. Um, and then for those of you who are also actually anywhere, but for those of you who are in Alabama, we do offer a full program of summer classes. Uh, you can't be an REU and take classes, but you could take classes in one year and be an REU in another year. And so you can come from anywhere to participate in any of our classes and you just look for the bulletin. It looks something like this for summer 2023. And we have a whole range of classes and all of these are posted online as well. So you can look for them there. So I will go ahead and stop here and open it up for any questions. I know it's a lot of information to fly at you, but I want to get it all done in an hour. So let me know if you have any questions. You can feel free to go ahead or put it in chat or raise your hand or whatever you'd like to do. I have a quick question about the letters of recommendation. Yes. Um, would you prefer for them to come from professors or is it also okay if we get like past employers to write us some? Yeah, actually, that's a great question. You can certainly have faculty member and past employers are just fine too. You know, having somebody who knows about your work ethic and knows about you personally is a great person to select. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I do see a question in the chat. It said, would, would be, be be working every day, seven days a week? Um, that's also a great question. Uh, it kind of depends on your project and your mentor. Like I said, this is immersive, um, but often, you know, some projects, you know, usually what happens is it just depends on the project. So if you are doing a particular type of field work that you maybe are doing really long field work for a couple of days, that might mean maybe you're working all day Monday, Tuesday, but maybe then you don't work on Wednesday, but maybe you have to work on a Saturday, but then you don't work on a Friday. Right. So it just kind of depends on what the demands are of the project. And you might have some days where you have really like two really long days, like 16 hour days in a row. But then maybe you're just going on a field trip the next day and you know relaxing and doing other things. So it just depends on the individual lab and your mentor and your particular project. But the cool thing about the work that we do is it does give you a really flexible schedule. So it may mean that in the middle of the day, you're free to go to the beach and have your lunch and have fun and do something. But then the next day you're on the boat all day, you know? So it's, it's just really, really flexible. Um, yes, Melissa, you can definitely stay on after. I'm happy to answer any questions in private. Um, is the stipend given in a single payment or is it broken up? So that's another great question. Um, we actually break it up. So you will receive your meal stipend every week. 
So you'll get that weekly, but then your paycheck will actually be divided up and you'll receive bi-weekly payments so that you will have money as you go during the summer, because we do also realize people have bills you have to pay and other things that you have going on personally, or you may want to go, you know, do whatever it is that you want to go do. Um, you know, students sometimes get together and go to movies or go to the art walks and other things that are going on. Um, so we break that up every two weeks in the summer so that by the end of the summer, you will have your full $6,000. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, great questions. <laughs> 